Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Dr. Glenn, for that introduction. Thank you all uh, for inviting me to be here today. It's a great honor. Um, so I wanted to talk not about my research in bone disease, but actually in the novel agents in sickle cell disease, um, as you can see. But I gave a version of this talk uh, about a little over a year ago to the Division of Hematology, and since that time, a lot has changed in the field of sickle cell management. So I wanted to share that with you all today. Um, let's see, I have no disclosures. So briefly, I'm gonna be talking about the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease, and then I'll switch and spend majority of the time on the disease-modifying therapies, old and new, and then present some clinical scenarios to all of you at the end. So sickle cell disease um, is a, a highly prevalent uh, hemoglobin disorder, which arises from a single-point nucleotide uh, variant on the beta-globin gene of hemoglobin. Uh, because of that one-point mutation, uh, it does lead to deoxygenation and uh, hemoglobin S polymerization in red cells that have uh, sickle hemoglobin. Heterocellular and endothelial um, aggregation with sickle erythrocytes, activated platelets, activated white cells, uh, do, do cause vasoclusion, and ischemia reperfusion injury recurs uh, often in people with sickle cell disease, uh, leading to inflammation. Hemolysis and the release of free hemoglobin also causes nitrous oxide scavenging, vasospasm, uh, and ongoing inflammation. There is dysregulation in the vasomotor tone, and all of these combine to cause recurrent painful episodes uh, in people with sickle cell disease. That is the hallmark of the disease. And over time, due to repeated uh, episodes of hypoxia reperfusion, it e leads to uh, end organ damage. Uh, there are various sickle um, syndromes uh, that are available, that are not available, that are present uh, in people. The one that we are most common with is uh, common, uh, the one that's most common is the homozygous sickle cell disease or HBSS. It's also clinically indistinguishable from hemoglobin S beta zero thalassemia. And then I kind of like this list because it goes more or less in order of severity with the different uh, sickle genotypes with the very last one, a co-inheritance of sickle hemoglobin and hypersystem fetal hemoglobin, essentially um, resulting in no manifestation of sickle cell disease. The clinical complications are myriad. Uh, this is not uh, an exhaustive list or exhaustive uh, representation by any means, but I do like that it's split into acute complications and chronic complications, and you can see that there are a lot of things that are very similar across both um, both spectra of diseases or complications or things that arise in sickle cell disease. So basically, I think about sickle cell, someone once told me that it's not necessarily a blood disease, but a disease of where the blood goes. And so if you think about it that way, everywhere really is susceptible to injury uh, if you have sickle cell disease, both acute and chronic. With regards to an overview of the management of some acute complications of sickle cell disease, I like this table because it lists the most common complications you can see in adults, and then the evidence between how we manage um, these complications. And so vasoocclusive crises, as I said a few slides ago, is the hallmark of sickle cell disease, and it's typically managed by a combination of pain, uh, opioid analgesics and non-opioid analgesics, and then intravenous fluids. Uh, there is fairly strong evidence to support managing uh, uh, acute vasoclusive crisis this way. Uh, but then the corollary of that, chronic sickle cell disease pain, uh, we have very little evidence of how to manage that. And we sort of extrapolate from the acute management, but we're not always very successful. And then there's a whole list right here um, of other acute complications and how we manage them um, and with the level of evidence. So moving on uh, to the disease modifying agents, which is the bulk of what today's talk will be on. Hydroxyurea is one as a medication that's been around, at least FDA approved, since 1998 for adults with sickle cell disease. And it wasn't until 2017, uh, December 2017 to be precise, that it was approved uh, for use in children with sickle cell disease. So it was the only thing that we had in our armamentarium for many, many years. And the use in children was actually extrapolated for lots and lots of studies until it was finally approved in 2017. So as I said, it is um, 
kind of the prototype uh, for how we manage the complications of sickle cell disease. And it works in a myriad of um, their mechanisms of action is multi-fold uh, and why, and they would explain why uh, it is beneficial in people with sickle cell disease. And so it does stimulate fetal hemoglobin production. So if you're making fetal hemoglobin, you're not making sickle hemoglobin or your percent sickle hemoglobin goes down fairly accordingly. Uh, it also decreases um, neutrophils and reticulocyte counts. So, so if those neutrophils are not extravasating or going to the areas of inflammation, it might decrease vasoclusion down the line. Uh, it does decrease um, adhesion of sickle erythrocytes to the vascular endothelium. Um, it does uh, decrease the rate of sickling and hemolysis that occurs uh, with sickle erythrocytes. And it also releases nitrous oxide and eases the strain of vasospasm um, uh, for people with sickle cell disease. So all these things go to show how it addresses different areas or different mechanism of, mechanisms of injury and how it is effective. Um, many people think, you know, if you're not seeing a rise in fetal hemoglobin or a rise in the MCV, then it's not efficient. But that's actually not the case. There are many different things that we look at since this is a lab medicine audience. In my clinical practice, I look at fetal hemoglobin, I look at MCV, I look at a decrease in the neutrophil count, a decrease in the platelet count, a decrease in the reticulocyte count, decrease in markers of hemolysis, um, T, Billy, LDH, all the things that you would look at. So I look at the whole picture uh, for the patient who's on hydroxyurea if they are compliant, and if I titrate it to the maximum tolerated dose uh, before I decide whether or not to switch therapy. So this is rather small font, um, but it's basically what I talked about just now. Different things to look at is you want to make sure you have the baseline laboratory studies that I just um, highlighted, and you want to start hydroxyurea at an appropriate dose for children and for adults. So for adults, my, my practice is primarily full of uh, adults with sickle cell disease, so we start them at a dose of 15 mg per kg per day. Uh, that should be the starting dose, and then you titrate up you round it off to 500 milligrams, which is the most common formulation that we have. And then you titrate it up um, accordingly until you reach the maximum tolerated dose, which is the dose at which your neutrophil count is approaching uh, 2,000. So you're inducing a mild neutropenia. Um, and then you technically should not exceed a dose of 30 to 35 milligrams per kilogram per day uh, of hydroxyurea in an adult. In children, it's, it's, it's quite different. So the FDA clinical indications for hydroxyurea and sickle cell disease are for children two years and older, but it's okay. There's a wealth of evidence, um, mostly from the baby hook trial, that you can use hydroxyurea in children as young as nine months of age. And they essentially don't have any complications of sickle cell disease if they're started that young. In adults with sickle cell anemia, so SS or S beta zero thalassemia, uh, if they're having frequent crises, um, if they've had recurrent or severe acute chest syndrome, or if they have pain that it interferes with the daily activities of daily living or the quality of life, you should start them on hydroxyurea. There is less evidence for starting hydroxyurea in people with non um, severe hemoglobin, non-severe SCD genotype, so hemoglobin SC or S beta plus thalassemia. Um, there's less evidence, but you, we can still do it um, if they have ongoing pain. And then for people with sickle cell disease and uh, chronic kidney disease, it's a little bit of a challenge to titrate up the hydroxyurea because you have to um, factor in their renal uh, clearance. And so for those people, the evidence is not as strong for starting hydroxyurea. All right, so moving on to L-glutamine uh, or Indari. So this was uh, FDA approved uh, for use in sickle cell disease also in 2017, uh, July, I believe. If we're thinking about the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease, and I had mentioned earlier that there's ongoing inflammation and scavenging of nitrous oxide. So glutamine or L-glutamine uh, what we'll be focusing on for the next few slides is part of a family of oral agents um, that do, that the downstream effect that it does is that it does release nitrous oxide and it basically um, stabilizes the redox potential of the red blood cell and prevents it from hemolyzing. Uh, that's kind of the main way that it works uh, for people with sickle cell disease and it was studied for several years before it was finally approved uh, for use and it was, like I said, the only it was the second drug that was approved after many years uh, of study. 
So um, the phase three trial was published uh, in 2018, but the drug was approved in 2017. Um, it was studied in um, a group of 230 uh, children and adults with sickle cell disease. They were randomized in a two to one ratio to either receive L-glutamine um, at a dose of 0.3 grams per kg per day, uh, BID actually, uh, versus placebo. And they were followed for a 48 week treatment period uh, with some uh, follow-up time after the end of uh, treatment. Um, it required recruitment from multiple sites around the country, and then in the analysis period, people were stratified by their use of hydroxyurea and also by the site. Uh, the primary endpoints for the L-glutamine study was the number of sickle cell crises that occurred within the 48-week treatment period. Uh, and then they also looked at uh, the administration of IV narcotics or opioids uh, in the hospital or in the emergency room. They looked at the frequency of acute chest syndrome, priapism, and splenic sequestrations, all acute complications of sickle cell disease. And then some of the secondary endpoints are listed here. Um, for, L for the L-glumine study, um, the randomization was uh, pretty even across both study arms. And what I wanted to point to your attention that was that roughly two-thirds of people in the L-glutamine and not, uh, placebo arm were on stable doses of hydroxyurea, and they were allowed to continue on hydroxyurea throughout the study. So in analysis of the results at the end of 48 weeks, uh, there was a decrease in the frequency of pain, median frequency of pain crises uh, by 25% in patients who were on L-glutamine. So on average, those on placebo had four episodes of VOCs per year versus three episodes, so a modest decrease. Similarly, um, there was a decrease of about 33% of the frequency hospitalizations on those, for those on L-glutamine versus uh, placebo. Um, we found, or the investigators found, that this same decrease in the frequency of admissions or frequency of hospitalizations uh, stayed true even if they were on hydroxyurea versus not on hydroxyurea. They also looked secondarily at the time to first sickle cell crisis, um, and it was delayed by 30 days in people receiving L-glutamine versus placebo. The time to second crisis was delayed by almost 80 days um, for people on the treatment arm versus placebo. So overall, um, this oral medication that's taken twice daily, it's a powder formulation that's reconstituted in um, your beverage of choice. It, doesn't, it can't be hot, but you can put it in anything you want, um, basically. Uh, taken twice a day can reduce the frequency of crises, frequency of hospitalizations, and the time to your next episode of crisis. And um, it didn't matter if you were on hydroxyurea, but it seemed that if you were on hydroxyurea, you still had an added benefit with L-glutamine. And the dose is as follows. And so when it was FDA approved, um, the indication was to use in anyone five years or older. So I will tell you, in clinical practice, um, it doesn't always work that way. So many patients don't like powders, and they don't like reconstituting their medications. And if they're not taking hydroxyurea, they're for sure not going to take L-glutamine uh, that's given twice a day. But I have found that in some patients who have um, reservations to hydroxyurea because it does have, uh, you know, it has the label of being a chemotherapeutic drug, uh, or patients who feel that um, it has uh, untoward side effects, I have had some success with L-glutamine uh, in that particular patient population. But once again, it is very hard to take something twice a day, uh, essentially, for the rest of your life. All right, any questions so far? All right, moving on. So the next drug that I'll talk about uh, was newly approved in November of 2019. It's cruzeluzumab. Um, or Adecvio. I, I don't know how they came up with that name, uh, but I'm just going to call it crizoluzumab for the rest of this talk. So what it does is that it targets, crizoluzumab and its other family of drugs targets um, the selectins or adhesive molecules that are uh, in play when you have um, ongoing vasoclusion with sickle erythrocytes and neutrophils are sort of extravasating to that site with uh, activated platelets. And so all of these um, cells are being attached to one another, forming these dense aggregates uh, with a family of selectins. And so crizoluzumab is a humanized monoclonal antibody that targets P-selectin that's on the endothelial surface and also on platelets. 
Um, it is dosed monthly uh, in the clinical study and in real world. We give the first two doses two weeks apart and then monthly thereafter. I'll go through this a little bit quickly. So it is found um, at, in the sort of baseline storage granules of endothelial cells at rest and at platelets. Um, when you are under physiologic stress uh, or under like an inflammatory stress with sickle cell disease, um, the P-selectin um, migrates to the surface of the endothelial cells and then it um, propagates or it mitigates the adhesion of these uh, activated cells to the endothelial surface and to one another. And so if you're blocking it at different sites, you can see how that downstream would decrease uh, these occlusion. In animal models, um, mice models of sickle cell disease um, that lacked the P-selectin ligand, they essentially, after putting them under hypoxic perfusion stress, did not have any sickle crises. Um, and then when they were giving P-selectin, when they had wild-type mice, they also didn't have sickle crisis. And so that was the baseline of studying it and then um, in people with sickle cell disease. And so the SUSTAIN study, I think we've lost light, but the SUSTAIN study uh, looked at crizoluzumab for the prevention of pain crises uh, in sickle cell. So it was a phase two RCT, placebo control, double blind. Um, they were looking at the safety and efficacy of crizoluzumab plus or minus hydroxyurea. They had three arms, so a, a low dose, high dose, and placebo arm. Um, the inclusion criteria listed there. And one thing of note is that it was for people who had frequent episodes of pain. So anywhere from two to 10 episodes of acute crises that would lead them to the hospital or the emergency room within a 12 year period. Um, there was 198 people that were enrolled from multiple sites across the country and outside of the country. And it was okay for them to be on hydroxyurea, um, but they could not be getting blood transfusions. So the primary endpoints are there. Um, they wanted to look at the annual rate of adjudicated sickle cell pain crises. Uh, and then they had a number of secondary efficacy endpoints. Um, they also looked at the median time to first and second pain crisis. And then for safety endpoints, um, it's everything that's listed here. So I'll go over the results um, in the next few tables. So looking at the intention to treat population, the reduction in frequency of sickle cell pain crises in the uh, people receiving the high dose of crizoluzumab, it was formerly known as cell G1, so that's what it will show up on these slides, um, was 45% reduction compared to placebo. And then in those receiving the medium dose, or two and a half mg per kg, of crizoluzumab infusion once monthly, um, the reduction was 32% in the intention to treat. In the actual per protocol, so there was a lot of switching uh, from the medium to the high dose, um, the reduction uh, in frequency of crises was much more stark in those who actually received uh, the high dose, so over a 50% reduction in pain crises compared to placebo. When you stratify by hydroxyurea use, I think it was really interesting to see that it was a more modest reduction in frequency of pain crises, but an important one nonetheless. Um, and then when you looked at folks that were not taking hydroxyurea at all, um, the high dose arm was the only efficacious arm uh, with a 50% reduction in pain crises compared to placebo. Interestingly, when you certify by sickle cell genotype, so a lot of clinical studies of sickle cell disease, um, they often uh, exclude folks that have the milder phenotypes or mild genotypes of sickle cell disease. And I really like the sustained study because it included everyone. And when you stratify the results by genotype, those with SS or S beta zero, so the more severe forms, uh, it was a modest decrease. And I think that's because uh, having the severe phenotypes or having the severe genotypes, I'm sorry, is collinear with being on hydroxyurea. More often than not, these people were the ones on hydroxyurea. <laughs> Um, and then for those who uh, were uh, not SS, um, there was, once again, a stark dif difference in people that were receiving the high dose and not the medium dose. Looking at the days hospitalized um, in the high dose versus placebo, it was a nearly 42% reduction in the, in the number of days hospitalized per year and none in the low dose. The median time to first sickle cell crisis uh, for those in the placebo arm was about one month, which is roughly, for people with severe disease, is roughly typical. And then that increased to a four months in people receiving the high dose of uh, L uh, crizoluzumab. The time to the second sickle cell pain crisis was also prolonged. Um, so it was about 10 months versus five months, um, 10 months in the high dose arm versus five months in placebo. 
and this is also a little bit of a small font, I apologize for that, but um, it does uh, list here the adverse events that were over 10% in either group. And so the main things that were in those receiving uh, the crizolizumab at the high dose were headaches, back pain, um, nausea, arthralgias, and uh, some pain in the extremities. Uh, but otherwise, the adverse events were similarly distributed across all three groups. So in summary, um, the high-dose crizolizumab, so the five mg per kg per, um, per month, essentially, uh, did significantly reduce the frequency of sickle cell pain crisis, regardless of your genotype, regardless of concomitant hydroxyurea use. It did prolong the time to the first and second crisis, and the incidence of adverse rates was comparable. And so um, the approval for crizolizumab uh, was essentially the age group that was studied in this, in this uh, sustained trial. So anyone 16 or older with sickle cell disease, and specifically those who have frequent episodes of pain, regardless of hydroxyurea, regardless of their sickle genotype. All right. Uh, moving on to Voxelator, um, or Exbrita. Uh, I will stick with Voxelator. So the way that this works is a completely different mechanism to everything else that we had described previously. Uh, it does target sickling, so that portion of um, uh, the red cells actually adhering to one another, forming dense polymers, and then attaching to activated neutrophils and, and activated platelets. The way that it works is that it binds to hemoglobin, preferentially, and it increases its oxygen affinity such that it's not being deoxygenated and not sickling and not triggering down all the cascade that we talked about before. Um, it was previously called GBT440, um, and so that's what you see on this diagram. And then the other agents here also have um, sanguinate binds carbon uh, monoxide and oxygen to red blood cells and prevents sickling. And SCD101, which we won't talk about at all today, um, the mechanism of action is unclear. Uh, so this study was published in 2019, and the drug was FDA approved, I believe, the week of Thanksgiving, so late November 2019. Uh, here is the study schema. So 274 people uh, were randomized to either receive 1,500 milligrams of oxalator, 900 milligrams or placebo. Um, you can see the breakdown here. Very similar to uh, the crizolizumab study, about 67% of them were on hydroxyurea. And more importantly, most of the patients on this study were either SS or S beta zero. Very few of them were SC or other. The primary uh, endpoint in this study was the change in hemoglobin uh, from baseline to 24 weeks, although people were on the study drug for as long as 72 weeks, on average 40 something, 43 weeks. But the primary endpoint was the change in hemoglobin um, from baseline to 24 weeks. And as you can see uh, in the first, in this first waterfall plot, about 60% of people receiving 1,500 milligrams of oxalator had an increase in their hemoglobin. Uh, some had an increase of up to four grams per deciliter with this drug, but on average, um, the hemoglobin increased by at least a gram in the people receiving the high dose. A little bit less than 40% of people receiving the medium dose of 900 milligrams of oxalator daily had an increase in their hemoglobin, and on average, uh, less than 10% of those who were on placebo had an increase in their hemoglobin. If we look at um, the least uh, mean change or least square mean change in hemoglobin, it shows the same thing. So about a one gram per deciliter improvement in those receiving 1,500 milligrams, and about, um, a, about little over a half a gram per deciliter for those in the medium dose, and not really any change in people receiving placebo. Similarly, markers of hemolysis decreased across the board for the most part for people that were on the high dose of oxalator. So they had less reticulocytes. Um, there was a, a decrease in their LDH, their absolute reticulocyte count, and their bilirubin compared to people that were on the medium dose versus placebo. The side effect profile was also somewhat similar to uh, crizolizumab. So headache, diarrhea, nausea, arthralgias were the more common things. Um, in people receiving boxelator, either at the high dose or the median dose uh, compared to placebo. What is really important here, I hope it's hard to see, but there really was no change in the frequency of pain episodes uh, or pain crises within um, the space of, uh, between those who were receiving uh, all three arms of the study drug. 
um, or placebo. So there was no change in the frequency of pain crises. And then the investigators argued that that wasn't what they were powered to detect in this particular study. Um, they were powered to detect their primary endpoint, which was the change in hemoglobin at 24 weeks. Um, so there are ongoing studies to see if there are actually clinical benefits uh, to people receiving voxelatory other than just a change in hemoglobin. So I thought I would end with some clinical scenarios. So my team and I, uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about, okay, now all of a sudden we have these drugs that we can treat our patients with. Who should we put on what and how should we go about doing it? So these are real life scenarios, things that I thought about as early as like last week. All right, so uh, there's a six year old man uh, with SS disease, pretty severe SS disease. He's excellent, has excellent compliance with hydroxyurea. Hemoglobin F is in the mid-20s, and it's been consistently so for many years. But he continues to have ongoing hemolysis, and he's symptomatic uh, from his hemoglobin of 6. And so, um, you know, he holds a full-time job, uh, wants to be active, um, but feels tired all the time. And, you know, we don't want to just transfuse him uh, because he's kind of gotten used to this level of fatigue. And so what do you guys think would be an option for him um, based on the few drugs that I just talked about? for the most part. Anybody can yell out anything. Voxelator, so yes, Voxelator for him. Um, so, you know, he meets all the criteria and he's somebody who would benefit from having maybe hemoglobin a little bit higher. Hard to know um, if that will really make a difference in him, but that's what we decided to pursue for this person. Next patient, 18-year-old um, woman with SS disease, pretty severe. On average, she would have four vasoclusive crises per year. Uh, but she was being treated, before she came to our clinic, she was being treated with hydroxyurea that she was taking uh, at 500 milligrams three times a day. And she'd done that for years. Uh, but her rate of crises did not change. And then when she um, came to our clinic, we switched, or just before she came to our clinic, she was switched to 1,500 milligrams daily, which is the appropriate dose that she should be on, and has not had any episodes of pain since then. What do you think we should do different for this uh, patient who's asking me, when she came to meet me in clinic, she said, I want to be on one of these new drugs. Um, uh, and this, you know, this was basically her clinical scenario. What do you guys think uh, I should do in this case? Stay the course, that's actually pretty good. So she, uh, yeah, I kind of, I told her that exact same thing. I said, I think you're gonna be okay on the appropriate dose of hydroxyurea, but she was pretty adamant. Um, you know, it's, she's in college, doesn't wanna be disrupted and be in and out of the hospital with her episodes of pain. She's not convinced that she's not gonna have pain anymore uh, for the most part on this appropriate dose of hydroxyurea. And so I thought, well, maybe I could add something that you know, should be well tolerated. She's pretty compliant with hydroxyurea. I talked about L-glutamine. Uh, I got a hard no. <laughs> she said, I already take a drug once a day. I don't want to take any other oral drugs. I want the IV. And so we're sort of thinking about for her, should her crisis recur on this dose of hydroxyurea, we will most likely start her on crizoluzumab. It wasn't my first choice, but it was one that she really strongly felt. Uh, she, strong, she felt strongly about. Uh, next person, a 24-year-old woman with SC disease. Uh, she is intolerant of hydroxyurea. Uh, she does take L-glutamine intermittently, uh, but she does have ongoing crises, two or more per year. Uh, what do you think I should do in this case? What's that? Crizolizumab. So crizolizumab is a good option for this patient. I briefly th thought about Voxelator, but... Um, once somebody is not adherent to an oral, uh, once daily oral, there's just no way, and she's not adherent to uh, her L-glutamine either, she takes it as she remembers. I didn't think adding another oral agent would be a good choice for her, and because she has SC disease and ongoing pain, I can actually use crizoluzumab, and she was ecstatic about this option. And the last person uh, is a 35-year-old man, SS disease, with stage 3 CKD. When I first met him, his baseline hemoglobin was 5 grams per deciliter, and he was fairly symptomatic with that. Uh, I was only able to titrate up his hydroxyurea to an equivalent of about 10 to 12 um, uh, milligrams per kilogram per day, so quite suboptimal. And his hemoglobin rose by a gram, but that's about it. We kind of hit a ceiling effect. 
Um, in this case, what do you think would be the way to go? He doesn't have pain episodes per se, but he has uh, uh, significant anemia. Any takers? Should I push the hydroxyurea regardless of uh, his neutropenia? Or should I try one of the new agents? Not a leading question. <laughs> <laughs> So what we decided to do, uh, although I haven't talked to the patient about this yet, I was supposed to see him yesterday and he uh, rescheduled, but I, I felt really strongly that he would benefit from Voxelator. He is pretty compliant with hydroxyurea for the most part. And his primary, um, the reason why I can't really go up on his dose is his renal function is poor uh, with hydroxyurea, whereas uh, Voxelator is not renally metabolized at all. So I wouldn't have any um, contraindication to put in him on Voxelator. So, in summary, um, you want to do hydroxyurea regardless of the MCV or fetal hemoglobin rise. Um, it's okay to start it in children as young as nine months old. Um, you want to titrate up to the maximum tolerated dose based on the ANC, and also the patient's tolerance, of course. Uh, there is a modest a decrease in frequency of pain episodes and hospitalization if you add L-glutamine, and I consider adding L-glutamine if somebody has mild disease to begin with. Um, you should consider crizolizumab in all sickle genotypes, especially if they're having ongoing frequent pain. And then voxelator for people who, you know, for the most part, their manifestation of their sickle cell disease is a significant hemolysis. I think although the indication for voxelator is pretty broad, it's basically anyone with sickle cell disease 12 or older, um, I'm trying to target folks who um, should have the biggest bang for their buck, so to speak. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to leave you guys with some references and also some resources. Um, so the American Society of Hematology has an excellent benign hem hematology curriculum, and they have a sickle cell course that goes through all of these. It's not as updated yet, so it doesn't have all the new agents. Um, but there is one module that talks about these novel therapies. Um, there is also the NHLBI, NHLBI Evidence-Based Management of Sickle Cell Disease that was um, published in 2014. Another version of that is coming soon. And then you can download onto your phone or your mobile device of choice um, sort of the take home points uh, from the huge document uh, from NHLBI. And uh, with that, uh, thank you all for your attention. Um, I put on here a whole host of folks, but um, I work with a large group of people, both within and outside UW. And so I just wanted to use this opportunity to thank them uh, for their ongoing collaboration. And I'm happy to take questions. Summary slide up here. Yes. So um, I don't know if you commented on, at the beginning. Uh, I may have missed that. Uh, there's some experimental protocols for uh, transplants for sickle, and I was just wondering how that interdigitates with where you're at with um, <clears throat> FDA approved treatments yeah. and then this like cure yeah. and what patients are asking and where you see that situated in the whole scheme of things. That's an excellent question. So you're right. I didn't preface it by saying that I wasn't going to talk about red cell transfusions or uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant, or even gene therapy for that matter. But that is a very real-time question. So I do have patients coming up to me saying, you know, I want, I'm okay, like I don't want anything new. I just want to, you know, I want to go for curative therapy. And so it's basically a question of availability, what we have available here at our center or elsewhere that I can send them to, and whether or not they meet eligibility criteria. So I can tell you that a lot of these studies, uh, specifically the gene therapy ones, uh, are, the inclusion criteria are extremely stringent. And so some of the <coughs> patients have had strokes, and some of them have had brain bleeds, and some of them have had other complications that um, excludes them from being part of these um, gene therapy and other curative intent treatments. And so it really just matters wh what's available, whether or not the patient meets criteria, and um, you know just where they are with their disease. Those are all the real-time factors, actually. That's an excellent question. Yes. Do you know if um, Voxelator interferes with laboratory testing? So patients coming in on Voxelator, do they have different ABG value? I mean, what is it? It's a very good question, actually. Um, let's see. Off the top of my head, yes. The one laboratory test that I know that it interferes with is for patients who are getting chronically exchanged. 
and we you know, measure their hemoglobin S before and after because we're trying to target a hemoglobin S of less than 30%. So because voxelator is, is changing the oxygen affinity of hemoglobin S, it does interfere with that one test. And so when we were talking to represent, representatives from the company, we were trying to figure out what alternate measures we could use uh, for these patients. To be honest, many of our folks who are getting chronically exchanged are not the ones that are going to be markedly anemic. Uh, and so if they opt to go on voxelator, because once again, it's a very broad indication, um, we just have to figure out, and I haven't figured it out yet, but we have to think about alternate ways to measure their sickle hemoglobin. Uh, similarly, with crizoluzumab, there was some concern in the clinical studies that it would uh, cause a sort of pseudothrombocytopenia or a functional or a functional uh, thrombocytopenia because they thought because it was targeting P-selectin that's preferentially on the platelets. But when they thought when they went back and they looked at their um, data, they thought it was because all these samples were being sent to a central lab to be analyzed, and um, there was some sort of um, lab artifact that was causing this thrombocytopenia. So it wasn't a real-time issue. And so the way that we're trying to go around that, we haven't actually started anyone in Chris about, but when we do, we'll have to measure the platelets in real time, um, not wait several hours. And so that's the way around that particular lab arbor value. But the sickle hemoglobin one is an important one uh, for voxelator. That's a good question. Any other questions? Well, Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention.